let's think about evaluation. Now, like a lot of the work around sleep, a lot of the evaluation, a lot of the evidence that's used to support um, reorganization theory is evidence from the animal kingdom. Now, if we look at somebody like our friend, the spiny anteater here, the echidna, we can see that the echidna has a very large forehead here. It's not his fault, don't blame him for it, but he does have quite a big forehead. One might almost call it a five head. Um, and that's because actually the, the spiny anteater, similar to the bottlenose dolphin, have massively enlarged frontal cortices, the bits at the front of the brain. They are enormous compared to the size of the rest of the brain. The reason for this is that they can't go into REM sleep for one reason or another. And so the brain needs way more storage space for all the weird stuff that they've seen and all the useless parasitic memories than we do. Because we can reverse learn, because we can get rid of all this useless information that we don't need, we don't need huge storage spaces. The echidna cannot, and so the echidna needs these huge storage spaces. So that seems to support the idea that reverse learning is for dealing with parasitic memories and that this occurs during REM sleep. The other thing to think about is that dreams are difficult to remember. We know that. It's really hard to remember dreams. And this is possibly because they're supposed to be forgotten. The whole point of dreams, according to this theory, is that they're random and meaningless and pointless. And so, of course, we want to forget them because that's the whole point. We're trying to forget this information. If we remembered our dreams in lots of detail, well, that would be counterintuitive because we're trying to get rid of this useless information, not remember it further. And Crick and Mitchison went further to kind of demonstrate this. They created what's called a neural network. They essentially connected a whole bunch of computers to mimic how the brain works. All right, these computers kind of worked in the same way that brain cells worked. And they found that the neural network, which could learn new information, got really easily overwhelmed and had way too much useless information in it. The best way to get rid of that useless information, a process that looked a lot like reverse learning. So when we look at kind of these computer simulations, they seem to suggest that reverse learning is an important part of why we are dreaming and what we do during REM sleep. On the other hand, our negative evaluation, this doesn't explain why are some dreams have strong narratives? Why do some dreams actually have a start, a middle and an end and are related to important things that we're thinking about? They should just be random, right? According to Crick and Mitchison, dreams are random and meaningless. So how come, you know, you might have a dream about somebody that you know really closely, or you might have a dream about a thing that you've been thinking about, or you might have a dream about, you know, the thing you're going to do tomorrow. That doesn't seem to make any sense uh, if what Crick and Mitchison are saying is true. And actually, Crick and Mitchison later adjusted their theory to only apply to bizarre imagery in dreams rather than all dreams. So they said that, actually, maybe this is this whole theory can't explain dreams as a whole, but they can explain why in that dream about the test that you're planning to do tomorrow, there's a weird purple elephant in the background. We also have no real evidence that this unlearning occurs in humans. We've seen it in animals, we've seen it in computer networks, but that's not the same as knowing it happens in humans. And we know that humans are very different to animals and computer networks in other ways. So we need to be careful that we don't just assume that because we can see it in one thing, that it's actually gonna apply in humans.